Good morning. It's a uh, public holiday today here in Hong Kong. It's Qingming, which means um, tomb sweeping day. It's also the first day, well, second day, of Rugby Sevens, Hong Kong Rugby Sevens, which I've never been to. <laughs> I'm terrible. And I have a cold, so this is going to be fun. Now, it's not Halloween. It is the opening of Pet Cemetery, the 2019 remake of the 1989 movie, which was adapted from the 1983 book, I think it was. Yeah, by Stephen King. So um, I'm actually, now that you've seen this, they gave these out the other night at the uh, at the opening of the premiere. So now that you've seen it, I'm going to take it off, put on my glasses. So. Okay, there we go. Wow, I feel hoarse today, so this is going to be fun. There are, just um, before I talk about Pet Cemetery, there, there are a lot of films opening in Hong Kong this weekend. I've seen five of them. I think there's six. I think there's a South Korean movie, which I didn't see. Um, there's two local films, uh, and then three uh, uh, international films. I'm not going to talk about all of them, because I'll be here forever. And um, I think my voice wouldn't last that long. So, uh, I'll talk about a few of them, and the others you can go look at my reviews on my website, which is howard4film.com, howardforfilm.com. All right. So, Pet Cemetery opened yesterday in Hong Kong. I think it opens today elsewhere around the world. A lot of hype about it. A lot of a lot of critics are loving this film, but I'm not one of them. <laughs> I just read a review as I was having breakfast. I just read a review, and all the things I didn't like about this film, the 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 movie critic who who did this review loved it, and I'm thinking. <laughs> Okay, you know, to each his own, but um, didn't hate it, didn't love it. Okay, so a little bit about it. You know, Stephen King, if you didn't know, he's, he wrote a lot of, he has, he's not dead, he's written a lot of books, over 70 novels, over 200 short stories, and a lot of them have already been made into films, um, and there are six more on the way. There are six more of his films, either in development or in post-production. I think there's still three more coming this weekend. So this uh, year, later this year, of course, the big one that everybody's uh, anticipating is It Chapter 2, which is due out on September the 6th. Looking forward to that because I liked It Chapter 1, or It as it was called. Um, and then a few others, I can't even remember what they are. And then next year, the next year in 21, 2021, there's going to be a few more. And that's just what they've announced. So Stephen King is in. He's He's hip. So now in this film, and honestly, you know, it's funny as I, as, before the movie started, I was sitting with my, my friend Jorge and who's a, who's a big fan of, uh, Stephen King. And he said, uh, have, he asked me, have you seen Pet Cemetery, the first Pet Cemetery? And I said, I don't think I have, I honestly don't remember ever seeing it. And now that I've seen this one, I never saw the first one. I'm not a Stephen King fan. Although having said that, I did love Misery. Uh, I did love, love Stand By Me. I, uh, these are not the books. I've never read any of his books, but the movies. And It, from two years ago, thought that was great. But other than that, like, okay, Carrie. Carrie's good. But the other ones, um, not my deal. Like, uh, Pet, uh, Cujo, never saw. Christine, never saw. All those other never saw. Them. Not my thing. All right, so in this adaptation... We have Lewis Creed, same as before. Um, he's played by Jason Clark, the Australian actor who does an amazing American accent. I, you know, when he was in that TV show years ago that took place in Providence, Rhode Island, I thought he was American, uh, but he's not. He's Australian. Um, he is an ER doctor who gives up the graveyard shift, ha ha ha, to um, in Boston for the quiet life in Ludlow, Maine. I like to see how Stephen King is from Maine, so a lot of his movies, or maybe even all of them, have uh, take place in Maine. Now, he and his wife, Rachel, played by Amy Simetz, who is in the wonderful movie from last year, two years ago, Lean on Pete. If you haven't seen Lean on Pete, really check it out. Great movie. Um, so he and his wife, Rachel, and their kids, eight-year-old Ellie, played by Jette Lawrence, or maybe she's Jette Lawrence, I don't know. She was wonderful. And uh, their toddler, Gage, Gage who was uh, played by a, a, a pair of twins. Um, they move into this really nice uh, ranch-style house on the town's outskirts. And before they finished even unpacking their boxes, Lewis has to deal with a grisly death of student Victor Pasco, 
at his university clinic. And I have to say, Victor Pasco in this film is played by an Ethiopian actor. So, good for you. Good, 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 good on the uh, casting. Um, meanwhile, Ellie discovers that behind their home lies a pet cemetery, which is misspelled S E M A T A R Y. Um, that the townsfolk have been using for the past uh, 100 years, 200 years, don't know, a couple hundred years, I guess. Um, and it's during that outing that Ellie meets their neighbor, Judd Crandall, who's played by the always fantastic John Lithgow. I saw him last night on Stephen, uh, Stephen Colbert's show. And, and Judd Crandall is a widower who has lived in Ludlow all his life. Now, a little while later, Ellie's, Ellie's pet cat, Church, uh, is killed. And Judd takes Lewis to a swampy area just behind the pet cemetery and tells him to bury the cat there. Now, much to the family's surprise, Church comes, <laughs> Church returns the next day, but he's changed into a mangy mess that has severe uh, anger management issues. Uh, but, you know, they, they deal with it. Now, Lewis uh, and Ellie's birthday, even a little further on, Ellie's uh, ninth birthday, tragedy strikes the family again. And Lewis decides he's not ready to depart with their beloved child. I'm not going to tell you which child. And decides to bury it in that mysterious area behind his home. Now, Judd figures out what Lewis has planned and warns him not to do it, tells him not to do it, but it's too late. And the next day, that child is back but has changed as well. And that's when things really start to get messy for the creeds. That's all I'm going to say. Um, if you've seen the original, or if you've read the book, it is different. Um, as I said, I haven't done either. But I had to, in writing this review, I had to do my research. So it is different. Um, there, are, there, are things, there are things in the first movie um, that were taken out. And Stephen King wrote the, um, the screenplay to the first one. He took things out. Uh, from the book when he made the first movie. Some of those things have been put back, um, and then other things have been changed. So it's even, all, all three are different. You know, they're generally the same, but there's, you know, there's, there's plot lines that are different. Um, now, as I said, the vast majority of critics are loving this film. I'm not sure why I did not love this film. It was okay. It's, it's, there's a lot that's really good about it. I thought the performance was really good, especially the little girl, Jette Lawrence, she was really good. I thought uh, uh, Jason Clark was very good. Of course, John, you know, John Lithgow is always good. Um, and I thought the movie's a wonderfully lean 97 minutes. I thought, thank God, uh, especially because we have um, the uh, Avengers film coming up that's going to be three hours and two minutes long. So I thought 97 minutes, good on you. I thought that was really good. But there's a lot that's just so cheesy about this film. Really, really cheesy. And there's, and, and the biggest problem I had with this film is Lewis's character. Because in this version, he's now the rational one of the family. And yet, you would think that somebody like him would have done really meticulous research on that piece of property before he bought it. Because, I mean... You know, I'm amazed. How did he not know that he had this ritual burial ground behind him, yet it's even on the internet? <laughs> you know, how, does he, how did he miss that one? And, you know, I don't know. And, you know, in that review that I had mentioned earlier that somebody that I read this morning from somebody said, oh, you know, because it was so commonplace in the town, you can understand why the property agent would have forgotten to tell him. I'm sorry. <laughs> You know? No, no, you don't forget something like that, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> it's, it's sort of illegal. So, um, you know, and then also, like, right in front of their home is this is this highway where trucks are speeding by. You know, they're coming out of nowhere and just speeding by at, at a moment, you know, every, you know, like this. Again, you think, you know... <laughs> You think he would have noticed that if he did a look see before he bought? You know, maybe he bought the place on on the internet as well, but off the internet as well without seeing it first. But um, you know, they didn't seem to be too perturbed about that. You know, and they have a little toddler, and when you got a little toddler and you have a highway right in front of your house, put up a fence. <laughs> you know, that I thought 
This is, this made no sense to me at all. Put uh, the, to me as a you know if, uh, if I were a parent of a toddler with a highway right in front, I that would be the first thing I would do. I would put up a fence. <laughs> but okay, you know let's you know now you know and about the running time. Here's what here's here's the thing. I rarely say this. I always say in you know usually movies are about ten minutes too long. Sometimes in the case of Avengers, about two hours too long. Um, but. I'd say this one's too short. This one, I thought, could have been about 10 minutes longer. I would have liked to have seen more about uh, Rachel. Rachel's story. She's got this irrational fear of death. I'm not going to tell you why, because if you've, if you've seen the first film, you don't know. If you've read the book, you'll, you'll know. But it wasn't in the first film. So she's got this irrational fear of death. And it is talked about um, a fair bit in this film. I thought it could have, I could, could have been more. To me, I thought that was a really good subplot. Could have been, could have dealt with more. Also, uh, when Lewis does some research into the burial ground on the internet, it's all of like four seconds. And I thought that could have been done more. There's a there's a whole subplot about Judd's late wife, which is really only dealt with at the end of the movie for again ten seconds. I thought that could have been a little bit more. So I would have liked the film to be about ten minutes longer. And, and and really, you know, fleshed out those subplots a little bit more. That's just me, okay? Now, the film is directed by Kevin Kolsch and, and Dennis Widmeyer. These are guys, they worked on a few other horror, thriller, movie productions, TV productions together. You know, for two guys who've based their career on, on this genre, I was a little disappointed because they've really, they haven't really upped the game here. You know, we have the very typical genre tropes here. We have flickering light bulbs, a dark basement, you know, the guy goes down to the dark basement, uh, the, the fog rolls in, the characters like to sneak up behind other characters, you know, we've seen that a million times before. Uh, you know what, you know, these guys are supposed to be masters of this genre on film, I didn't see that they brought anything new to it. I'll tell you, so, I'll tell you something though, if you like jump scares, you're going to love this film because there's lots of them, lots of jump scares. Unfortunately, there's also a lot of really stilted dialogue that will that will make you laugh um, for all the wrong reasons. And again, that that critic that I that I referred to earlier, he's saying, "Oh, you have to laugh because otherwise, you know, you're going to be digging your nails into the seat, on the arms of your chair." No, no, no. You're going to laugh because you just can go. This is just so absurd. That's why you're laughing. So, uh, anyhow. But, look, that, all of that being said, the movie is not a train wreck. It's not even close to being a train wreck. And, you know, the jury is out on to which of the two Pet Cemetery films is better. My friend Jorge says the other one was better. I haven't seen it. I don't know. Here's what I will say is, it was a lot better. <laughs> so, you know, and then you have, you have a lot of critics saying, oh, this is the best Stephen King adaptation for the past 30 years. Really? You know. I'm sorry. No, no, no. It was a lot better. So, uh, and look, it wasn't perfect either, but it was a lot better than this. So, okay, you want to see it? Def yeah, go see it. You know, if you want to be scared for a couple, 97 minutes, go see it. You know, not great. Not great at all. So, anyhow. All right. Next film is a, um, it's a Spanish film by Iranian director Asghar. I'm going to take this off because it's hot. Wow. That's hot. It's, um, it's a Spanish film by Iranian director Asghar Farhadi, who's won, who's won a couple of uh, Oscars already. Um, and this is his first Spanish-language film. Very, very interesting. Um, and it's, it's called Everybody Knows. In Spanish, it's Todos so los Saben. Mm -hmm. And it stars the real-life husband and wife, Javier Bardem and Penelope Cruz. But here they don't play husband and wife, they play ex-lovers. And the story is that Laura, who's Cruz's character, she's lived in Buenos Aires for the past uh, 20 years or so, along with her husband Alejandro, played by Argentinian actor Ricardo Darren, and their two kids, 16-year-old Irene and 7-year-old Diego. And now she's returned to her hometown, located somewhere near Madrid. I'm going to drink a bit of coffee here. For her sister's wedding, and she's brought the kids along. Now everything starts off perfectly well with a happy and lively uh, celebration, but it all comes to a crashing halt 
when Irene, the daughter, is kidnapped from under everyone's nose at the wedding. And the kidnappers are demanding 300,000 euros in ransom. And that's something, that's a sum of money that Laura doesn't have. In fact, no one in this town has, except for Paco, who's Javier Bardem's character. And, um, and as I said, they are, they're ex-lovers and they're still, they're friends today. They're still friends today, but they're, they were ex-lovers. Now, as Laura relies on Paco to try to find Irene, suspicion ripples through Laura, Laura's family as they try to work out who may have snatched the teenager. And there's no shortage of suspects who had plenty of motive from Paco, and I'm not going to tell you why, uh, to Laura's father, and I'm not going to tell you why, to even her husband Alejandro, who's sitting in Argentina because he decided he didn't want to come to the wedding. So they all have plenty of, of motive for taking the girl. Um, <clears throat> now, for many, as we learn, for many in Laura's family, what's past is not past. They don't forget. So things have happened over the years, and they have not forgotten. Now, many of Farhadi's films, they explore class divides, and this film, everybody knows, is no exception. Um, everybody in the town thinks that Laura must be rich because she lives in Argentina, but in fact, she's not. Um, many are also resentful of Paco because he began life as the son of a poor laborer, and now he's a landowner and he produces a healthy crop of grapes that are used for wine. And, and as warm and loving as Lara's family are, and, and the friends are, deep down, they don't like the change in the status quo. They're not happy that Paco is rich, and they're not, basically. And it used to be the other way around. Now, watching the wedding sequence, the wedding sequence is like the first 20 minutes of the film. You could be forgiven if you thought that this was directed by a Spaniard. He, Farhadi clearly understands the culture. He captures it flawlessly on film. I was so amazed. I was watching this. This was a beautiful wedding, beautifully shot. And, and I thought, he's Iranian. What does he know about this? But he really got it. And he said in interviews that when he was doing research, researching Spanish weddings in the south of Spain, I guess he must have gone to quite a few weddings to see, he noticed that they were very similar to the weddings that he went to in Iran as a child. He, he found that the, the, it was very similar. I've never been to an Iranian wedding. I don't know. Um, so that, you know, that was interesting. Now, equally impressive, he was at our, he was at our screening uh, last week, and um, somebody said, what's it like to direct a film in a language that you don't speak? And he said that was the smallest of his challenges. So he writes the he wrote the film in in Farsi, and then he's got translators who then work it out and uh, with the actors. So very 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 interesting. So he said language really is not a big issue. Now Cruz and Bardem they're always great, except you know okay they made this horrible film Loving pa Pablo last year, but you know what they all their their acting is always top notch. And here also their acting is wonderful. They have such they have such charisma together. Um, and, and as I said, it's nice that, you know, quite often they're playing or here, you know, loving Pablo, they were they were lovers. Here they're ex lovers. And I thought that was nice that they're excellent. You know, I thought as I was watching the film, I thought, why didn't he cast Bardem as the as Alejandro rather than Paco? And then that would have been a married couple playing a married couple. Yeah. So here he did it, married couple playing ex-lovers. I thought that was very good. Now, unfortunately, um, once the film's focus shifts from the wedding to finding Iran, the story becomes less interesting. And I think the problem is we really don't get invested in the te teenager's situation. We don't see her throughout the whole throughout the whole ordeal that she's kidnapped. So, and and we don't see the we don't. So we don't even see the, the kidnap. We don't even know who the kidnappers are until the very end. So we don't, you know, we don't feel for her at all. We don't, you know, we don't get this sense of of panic. You know, we see we see Cruz's character Lara on the screen. She's she's panicking. She's helpless. You know, and 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 she's curious why somebody would do this. But we don't we don't get invested in that whole scenario. So I thought that was that was a little bit disappointing. Um, and, and I found that by the time we did find out who the kidnappers were and why they did it, um, 
you know, it, it was almost like, yeah, who cares, you know? I mean, because the film just started, the pacing just got slower and slower and slower and slower. And it's like, the, you know, this train is like sputtering to a halt. So, I don't know. I just thought, no, not so good. Not so good. You know, there are good scenes of secrets and motivations being revealed. I think there needed to be more of that. You know, there was not just the the, the secret that they were lovers. No big secret. Okay. Everybody knows means everybody in the town knew that they were once lovers. Um, but there's a lot of other secrets that come out along the way. I thought there was, should have been more of that and less of her looking powerless, you know. So, okay. So, I have to say, this is not Farhadi's best film, but his not best is still better than many directors' best. He's an amazing director. And, you know, all in all, it's a, it's a, it's a nice film. It's a good film. Uh, it's enjoyable. It's not going to win any major awards, but I'd say check it out. So that's called Everybody Knows Penelope Cruz, Javier Bardem. I see I'm running out of time here. The third film I want to talk about, I don't know that I'm going to talk about that one. Uh, <laughs> so as I was, I'll just talk about it very briefly. Two Hong Kong films, one called The Lady Improper, and it stars Charlene Choi, who's one half of the counterpop duo Twins. She plays a gynecological nurse in Hong Kong who has sexual intimacy problems. And she gets her mojo on by uh, meeting a chef at her father's uh, cha cha tang, his diner. And they sort of do a little ghost thing with some uh, pork loin. And um, she gets her mojo back on. And that and pole dancing. You know what? <laughs> horrible, 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 horrible. You know, <laughs> it's directed by a woman. And, and really, what this movie is all about is if you're a woman who has sexual intimacy problems, all you need is a good... <laughs> That's what this film is about. And I thought, oh my God, this is 2019, and it's directed by a woman. Horrible. Horrible. They should, she should be ashamed of herself for making a film like this. They Actually, they don't even know who wrote it, because they don't tell you who wrote it. I've been checking everywhere. Maybe the director wrote it. I don't know, but nobody's talking about it. Um, shame on you to... <laughs> To do a film like this. The other film that's, that opened yesterday is called P Storm, uh, which in Canada means something very, very different. It's the letter P. It's the latest film starring Louis Koo. It's part of a series. Uh, it's the third film in the series. There are different letters. I think the first one was Z, the second one was S, this one's P. Next year there's going to be G. It's about the chronicles of uh, we have a we have an organization here called ICAC Independent Committee Independent Independent Commission Against Corruption, and he's a he's one of these uh, ICAC agents, and he goes undercover into jail, uh, into a Hong Kong prison. What? <sighs> just ridiculous. You know what? I'm just gonna say very quickly. It is so bad. It's good. That's all I'm gonna say about that film. That's called P Storm. Okay. Finally, the other big film opening today is Shazam, as, uh, what was his name, uh, Gomer Pyle used to say, Shazam, Shazam, Shazam. If you're too young, you don't even know what I'm talking about. Now, I just want to say, what kid doesn't want to be a superhero, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and if that was you then, or if that is you now, you're going to love this film. Because that's what this is all about. This is a kid who becomes a superhero. So the story is Billy Batson, played by Asher Angel. He's one of these uh, Disney Channel kids. He's a 14-year-old orphan who's been bounced around foster homes for, in Philadelphia for most of his life. And he was sent to live with a highly ethnically and, and physically diverse Vasquez family. And there he, defend, he, he befriends uh, his foster brother, Freddie Friedman, played by Jack Dylan Grazer, who was in Beautiful Boy, and also one of the kids in It, um, and I assume he'll be in the It Chapter 2 as well. And, he, and he's a disabled, self-professed superhero geek, about the same age. And one day at school, after Billy defends Freddie from a pair of bullies, Billy takes off, he ends up on one of the city subway trains, and suddenly everything goes cosmic and the doors open up onto a mysterious cavern where he's greeted by an old wizard played by Jimon Usu. 
And uh, he tells Billy that he was brought there because he is pure of heart and he's sort of able to resist temptation. And because of that, he's been chosen to receive the wizard's powers. And all he has to do is to get those powers, is hold on to the wizard's staff and say the wizard's name, Shazam! And when he does, Billy transforms into a mecha buff 30-something-year-old dressed in a red and gold superhero outfit complete with a Romanesque white cape. And Billy, who's now played by Zachary Levi, who uh, is probably most well-known for the TV show Chuck, and he was in second season of The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, and probably be in the third season as well, he is still a teenager inside, and he isn't sure what to do with his superpowers. He's not even sure what his new superpowers are, but he and Freddy quickly figure them out after a series of tests that Freddy video records and uploads onto the internet. And just in time, too, as supervillain Thaddeus Savannah, played by British actor Mark Strong, who embodies the seven deadly sins, has decided to come after the city's new superhero to steal away his powers. Now, with the box office successes in the past couple of years of Wonder Woman and earlier this year of Aquaman, the suits at Warner Brothers have finally figured out that audiences have grown tired of Batman and Superman, both separately and together. We want to laugh. We want to be entertained for a couple hours. We don't want to watch some brooding, parental-obsessed Cape Crusader um, save the world. Cape uh, Vigilante save the world. So, and... Although Shazam has its share of brooding superheroes and supervillains who have mommy and daddy issues, they wouldn't, because they wouldn't be DC characters if they didn't, uh, the film is delightfully light with its tongue placed firmly in its cheek. And, you know, interestingly, Shazam was once the world's most popular comic book character, outselling even Superman in the 1940s. But his appearance fell on hard times due to copyright infringement issues brought about by DC Comics because it was originally owned by another uh, comic uh, publisher. Uh, what was the name of it? I can't remember. And, and then DC sued, and then eventually DC bought the rights. And the character back then was named Captain Marvel, but by that point, um, DC was then sued by Marvel Comics, who said that they own the rights to a Captain Marvel character, and then the name was changed. Now, this whole business with the name change is, is really played up here because... Um, you know, in throughout the film, they're trying to, uh, Billy and, and uh, Freddy are trying to figure out what to call his character. And they come up with some really funny names for the character. So, uh, so I thought that was, that was very well done. He also, they, uh, the writers, they also throw some shade at some of the other DC characters. They throw, throw shade at Batman, Superman, Aquaman, not Wonder Woman, interestingly, unless I missed it. I thought that was really good. And by the time the third end credit scene rolls, um, you know, you're totally invested. And as I said, three end credits, so don't get up. Make sure you watch all three. The third one is very, very good. They're all good. So, um, you know what? I think this was what I liked about the story is, is Zachary Levi's uh, job, uh, his portrayal of, of a little boy, of a teenager. I thought he was really you know, wide eyed. Naive, you know, not naive in some sense, and sort of worldly, and in, in as as a teenager thinks he is. I thought really well done. The superhero, and also the two boys, uh, the young the young actors, they have really good chemistry together. It wouldn't surprise me if they're friends in real life because they had really good chemistry together. I thought the the outfit, the super the Shazam outfit, was wonderful. It was tacky, but really well done. Tacky, you know, retro tacky. He was like muscles, you know, out to here. I, and what I what I enjoyed was that Levi really played that up. You know, he's got this huge bulk, and you can imagine a fourteen year old suddenly in this bulky outfit, and he's, you know, he's walking like this. I thought really, really well done. Also, they lacquered Levi's hair so well that you know, anytime he was thrown around by Doctor Savannah, nothing moved. <laughs> You know, which was really also nicely done. So I thought very, very well done. I mean, um, I thought also, you know what, there's a, sto there's a story here too. You know, aside from, you know, the basic story, there's an underlying message of family that you don't get to pick your family. And sometimes that's a good, that's a good thing. And I thought that was really good. It was very Steven Spielberg-esque in its nature. And very interestingly, 
Um, there's a scene that pays homage to the film Big, the Tom Hanks movie from about 30 years ago. And very interesting, Steel, Spielberg's sister Anne wrote the script to Big. So there is a, there is a, Sp a Spielberg uh, nod and a wink, for sure, for sure. So um, that was very, very well done. So I, I, I liked it. it. It's directed by Swedish filmmaker David Sandberg. He did uh, Annabelle Cre Creation. He also did Lights Out. This one was a big win for the DC Extended Universe. And I look forward to seeing more films by of with Shazam in the future. All right, 901, 31 minutes too long. Have a great weekend. Hopefully I will feel better next week and it won't be a public holiday. Have a great week. Bye.